So today I'm going to talk about table grapes, and we're not going to get too scientific today, but hopefully you'll learn a few things and get excited about the projects that we've been working on. Just a small initiative of our project that's really taken off in the last couple of years. So when I travel around and talk about wine grapes and grapes in Minnesota, people always ask, why? Why grapes in Minnesota? Uh, and this happens on every continent I've traveled to, and even here in Minnesota, people ask that question. And I say, well, you can just go outside and find grapes. So the answer is pretty easy. We have Vitus riparia, the native riverbank grape, and another grape, Vitus estivalis, that you can find here in Minnesota. And so sort of logically, it's like, well, we have the grapes, why not grow other grapes here too and improve upon them? And um, pioneers and settlers, the Europeans, as they moved into Minnesota, thought the same thing and took advantage of the grapes that were here. And the humans have had a long history with growing, domesticating and, and propagating grapes. And we're sort of inseparable for them from eating them. They're a great source of sugar, flavor, antioxidants for the wine that we like to consume for different reasons, for fun, as well as sacrament. So we're sort of inseparable from grapes. The wild grapes that grow here, they have small berries, they have high acidity, they have high sugar, which is good. Um, they have some interesting flavors, some good, some bad, like green pepper or cherry. And the most important for our breeding program is that the ones that grow here are cold hardy. And they also have pest resistance. And so the breeding that's been going on in Minnesota since the 1880s, uh, outside the university, within the university, has really focused on using these wild grapes as the backbone for survival and then integrating or bringing in better traits from quality grapes that have um, larger fruit, better flavors, uh, lower acidity from Vitus vinifera, which is the European wine grape. If we look at these maps real quick of the distribution of the genus Vitus in North America, we can see there's a number of species and depending on who's doing the counting, up to about 30 unique species of grapes here in North America. And I'd like to point this out because we're at the center of um, diversity here. And that means as a plant breeder, we can access these resources and use these different species to bring in traits that are important to us. Insect resistance, resistance to fungal diseases, um, cold hardiness, short growing seasons, long growing seasons, depending on where you're, you're focusing your breeding project, you can find these traits because of all of this diversity. The European wine grape is a single species, and so there's a, um, they're quite limited in terms of some of these traits. And so that's one of the reasons we've been very successful with breeding grapes here in Minnesota, is because we can walk outside, and I would urge any of you, I see lots of people out walking their dogs as something they're doing during this pandemic, you can probably find a grapevine growing within 100 yards of your house pretty much anywhere in Minnesota. So here's a, a photo of John Toole. John is one of our vineyard managers at the HRC. And this is at his uh, private vineyard in central Minnesota. And the European wine grapes can't live here, right? So these are hybrids that were developed at the university that he grows um, and makes a profit from, hopefully. And clearly winter is a problem. So Vitus vinifera is limited growing here in Minnesota and most places around our country. Um, it's been clearly very successful in places like California, Oregon, and Washington, and um, people are getting to do a better job growing these grapes in places like Michigan, Virginia, Long Island, upstate New York. Unfortunately, they don't grow here, so we do the next best thing and breed our own grapes. So Vitus vinifera is not cold tolerant. The season's too short to ripen the fruit, and those plants are susceptible to the diseases and in insects that we have here in Minnesota and across uh, most of the globe. So through breeding, we've been able to develop some new varieties. One of the leaders in this space uh, developing table grapes was Elmer Swenson. And Elmer Swenson was a dairy farmer from Osceola, Wisconsin. He grew up on a, a family homestead there. And he started breeding grapes in 1943, up until the time he died, which I believe was in 2004. And he created this, this legacy of cold hardy grape breeding in North America. He's had an instrumental role in starting the wine grape industry across the Midwest. And um, he used Vitus riparia that he found in the woods, like the picture um, shown on the right, where Vitus riparia was growing on his property. He connected with researchers like those at the university and used MIN78, one of our breeding lines. He got French hybrids that were 
developed for their pest resistance and he start breed, started breeding grapes, really wanting to get a table grape for the Midwest. Um, he didn't drink wine, but sort of ironically, the 30 or so varieties that he's produced, almost all of them are used in winemaking here in Minnesota and all around the globe um, in places like Poland and China. Um, he developed two varieties that were released with the university. So uh, after he retired from dairy farming, he joined the staff at the research center and uh, worked on the fruit breeding project. And he started sneaking in some grapes and eventually Edelweiss and Swenson Red were released as table grapes. Beyond that, as I mentioned, about 30 other grape varieties came out of his breeding program. And we're still actually evaluating some of those today to determine if they are going to be useful as um, additional varieties. The breeding process is pretty simple for grape, uh, at least in my opinion. And I'll just walk you through this quickly because we're going to hit a roadblock in the next couple of slides, why this doesn't work for breeding table grapes. In year zero of our project, we choose the parents that we want to cross through, self, uh, through cross, cross pollination. And that's kind of shown here as two different colored plants. We choose the male plant and the female plant, and we bring the pollen from the male and put it on the female. If that female has perfect or hermaphroditic flowers, we have to remove the anthers so it doesn't self-pollinate. And so that every seed that's growing inside the grapes that we did the cross-pollination on is unique, and we know the two parents um, for that seed. So those seeds develop inside the fruit during year zero, and then in September, October, we harvest the fruit, pull out the seeds, and then put them into a cold treatment called stratification. And here's where the seed's basically going through a winter, which um, helps it to germinate in the spring. So they germinate in March, and then they're growing in the greenhouse now um, until we get past our last frost date. And then we move them outside to the nursery for the first year. In our process, we dig them out of a nursery after the first year's evaluation, put them in a cold storage, and then in year two, over here on the right, we put them out into a family row. So these are the traditional vineyards with the, the trellis systems, and we're growing out those plants. They don't flower the first year, so we don't get any fruit when they're in the vineyard. It's not till years three or five when we start to see a few clusters showing up along the trunks, and then eventually as the plant gets big enough, it's producing a handful of clusters for us to give it a fair evaluation. So three to five years on average is when we see fruit for the first time that we can taste. If it's bad, we don't like the plant, it has lots of diseases or insect problems, we pull it out. If it's good, um, we maybe will clone it and put it into a couple of new places. If it's kind of good, we'll keep it around just to see how it performs over the next couple of years, waiting for a good test winter to see if cold temperatures will knock it out. Um, the top performing ones go back into the cycle, starting year zero over, they become the new parents, or as I mentioned, we clone them out. And by year 15 to 20, we've made some determinations that one or more of these might become the next new variety. So once we decide we want to um, clone out a plant or create a new variety, we have to propagate that single plant. Grapes don't grow true from seed. We say that they're highly heterozygous, um, which means that they're, they don't do inbreeding. And if we grow out the seeds, they're all unique. So we need to replicate these through cloning. And we use asexual propagation techniques called grafting and rooting cuttings. Grapes are weedy plants, they're vines, and they go through these methods very, very easily. And so we do this process and it's a great way to get hundreds, if not thousands of plants very quickly. So that works great to set up a vineyard, but for a breeding program, we need to have those seeds so that we get new genetic recombinations each of those cycles so we have new things to select from. So we're talking about table grapes. I should probably tell you what a table grape is. Uh, table grapes are the grapes that we consume fresh. You can consume a wine grape. That's great. You can call it a table grape. Um, but table grapes are usually bigger. They're typically seedless. Um, they usually have lower acids. And generically, they're the red, black, and green grapes that you can buy at the grocery store. And on the picture on the right, it shows a packing house in, in Chile where they are getting those grapes to send up here to grocery stores in spring, um, their summer, of course, they're harvesting to send them all around the globe. They have good texture. In my opinion, they have low flavor. They're about 18% sugar water packed, into, packed inside these um, plant cells. And the most popular ones that you're probably familiar with are Thompson Seedless, which is also called Sultana and Red Globe. 
So what makes a grape seedless? Um, there's a couple of different things that have resulted in seedless grapes, but the one I'm gonna talk about today is called stenospermocarpic seedlessness. That's a mouthful, tongue twister. It took me a, a lot of practice to get it right. You can practice on your, uh, on your own at home. Um, and what happens in this type of seedlessness is that the pollination step happens like normal and fruit development happens like normal. So the berries start to develop on the vine, but eventually something happens where the embryo is ab aborted. The mother plant sends some sort of signal to the ovule where the seed is developing and it stops that process. And the result is a non-functional seed. If you look over on the right, you can see three examples of what happens um, when this occurs. Centennial is a kind of a traditional California table grape, has a very small ovule. It, it got aborted sort of early. Minnesota 1369 is one of our breeding selections. It's a little bit bigger. It doesn't develop into a seed that you can plant. And then Swenson Red is a seeded variety. And you can see all on the same day that it has a really large seed. You would notice it if you chewed into it. And by the end of season, when you harvest once in red, it's hard, brown, um, and you would want to spit it out if you chewed, chewed on that. So we're working with this genetic, genetically controlled seedlessness, which means that in our breeding program, we don't get seeds. So if we make crosses where we use that mother plant, there's no seeds for us to grow out. So the cycle gets stopped. Well, fortunately, some researchers at the USDA um, in the early 1980s, uh, Dr. David Ramming in particular, um, developed some techniques for grapes where we can basically grow test tube babies. We can go in and pull out those seeds before they get aborted and grow them in test tubes and get plants. And actually, we can sometimes even speed up this process by skipping the nursery year because the plants are so big at the end of the first year. And I'm gonna talk about this process. So before the 1980s and at the University of Minnesota even um, until I started, the process for getting seedless grapes was to use a seeded female, so you got seeds, and then use a seedless male to donate the pollen and expect that some of that pollen would carry the, the alleles for seedlessness. Some of the offspring would be seedless, um, but not all of them. And recently we started doing DNA testing so that we could find this, the ones that were going to be seedless when they were still in the greenhouse, which speeds up the process. Um, the second thing that we've been able to do now um, because of an investment through um, staffing and also grant support is to use seedless females. We don't get the seeds, but we can use this technique called embryo rescue to recover those seedlings. But we had to figure out, will it work for cold-hardy grapes? We knew it worked in California, but does it work with these species, and how do we do it? So I've been for very fortunate to have a graduate student, Lizy Morera, who's been working on this project. And basically what we do is we can pull out the ovules, like this picture on the right, so those um, kind of pre-seeds before they get too large, put them into an artificial grape. So they're in a Petri plate on nutrient media with some plant hormones, with some sugars. We put them in the dark for two or three months and the embryos continue to develop. Uh, after two or three months, we go in and cut open the ovule. And this is what I think is a fascinating part is uh, with the right touch and with a, a, a nice microscope, we can go in and find the embryo. It's this really small thing sitting on the scalpel. We do this in aseptic conditions because we don't want to introduce bacteria or fungi into um, our test tubes. And we transfer them uh, onto a new media and they start to grow. But they're really small. They, they don't look all that different from the endosperm or the food source that's inside the seed. And sometimes they look like these heart shapes, which are early in development. Sometimes they're a little bit more developed like these here where we can see the cotyledons, which become the seed leaves. Um, and so here, the embryo is basically set up to grow into a new plant. We just need to give it some energy and a place to do it. So we transfer them into test tubes. Here we can see um, uh, outlined in the yellow circle. They're less than a millimeter in length, sometimes about half a millimeter. And we gently place them on the media and within um, 10 to 15 days, they start to germinate. And you can see it start to grow. The roots form normally, the shoots form normally. We get these cotyledons. And after two months, additional months of growth in the test tube, they're ready to be transferred to the greenhouse. Unfortunately, there's a kind of a tricky step that we had to work out what happens going from the test tube to the greenhouse. We've tried quite a few methods. 
Plants growing in test tubes don't have as thick of cells. They don't have this waxy layer called cuticle that's been developed. They haven't been exposed to wind or bright sunlight. So we, early on, we were losing quite a few plants at that step. But since then, we've, we've been very good, um, pretty efficient. And by um, late April, early May, our plants start to look like this middle picture. They look like normal grapevines, um, whereas the ones in our greenhouse are about 10 inches tall. These are a meter or more in height. They're ready to go to the field as soon as we get past the frost. So that's what these folks are doing in the field, planting our nursery, moving these plants to the vineyard. And of course, now we're going to have to wait three to five years to get those to fruit for the first time. Um, we've been pretty excited. We've been able to demonstrate that we can do this process pretty efficiently um, with one person doing this task. The, the breeding programs that do this commercially have five to ten people sitting in labs doing this and are really good at it. We're excited. We have between somewhere between 250 and 300 new plants to evaluate just this year. So of course we have to wait. Things that we'll be looking at are berry color, grape uh, berry size. Here we can see kind of a range from some of the smaller to the larger. The cluster size is important and then how compact is that cluster. Seedless table grape production prefer these big open loose clusters, which makes them look nice and easier to handle. So these are the traits that we'll be looking for in the future, in addition to how do they taste. So how do they taste? That's the kind of the important question. We know that flavor is important for wine grapes. We, we go to the store, we buy a, a bottle of wine, and we know based on the variety, some of the flavors and aromas to expect. Of course, those are altered during the winemaking practice itself, the yeast selection, the oak that was used, um, how it was handled. But wine grapes have this really descriptive lexicon. They have aroma wheels. I think all of us who've tasted wine think about what are the flavors. And this is just a short list. Citrus, pear, blackberry, hibiscus, tobacco, leather. Uh, you could probably spend an afternoon coming up with descriptors for wine grapes. But I bet none of you have thought about that. Well, maybe not none. I saw who's in the list watching today. Many of you have not thought about what does my table grape taste like that I get at the grocery store. But that's changing. Um, we're starting to see consumers wanting flavor. And partly this has to do with product dif differentiation. We're starting to see new varieties come out and people are asking them by name. And that's different than how we've been purchasing grapes for the last half century or so. We're now wanting to buy grapes based on their variety name or their flavor. And many of you have probably tried cotton candy or seen tutti frutti, grape soda, mango flavored grapes. And you're buying them and it's great because it's renewing interest in grape breeding, uh, it's pushing the boundaries of what grapes can taste like. And the best part is that consumers are willing to pay more, uh, up to 25% more than what I call the generic red, green, and black grapes. And to me, it's an improved eating experience. If it gets people eating fresh fruit, I think that's a win all around. So that uh, led to some hypotheses that we wanted to test to see if we could improve some of the flavors and choose the best flavors that consumers might want in our table grape breeding program. So the hypotheses that we're testing, and the folks on the right in the picture are the ones doing it, the graduate student on the right is Liza Morera. She's the one kind of leading these efforts with support from some folks from Adrian Hageman's lab in the Hort Science Department. So our question is, um, are flavor and aroma under genetic control? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, but, but how and when is the question we're trying to really answer. And then can we develop a DNA test to help us to, to predict and select the seedlings that have the desirable flavors when they're in year zero, as opposed to waiting to years three to five uh, to taste them for the first time? So can we, can we get the better plants out in the vineyard first so we don't have to taste the bad tasting ones? So I don't have to taste the bad tasting ones. That's the real um, catch there. So sensory evaluation is a key component of this. So Lizy um, has been developing this process in collaboration with Zeta Vickers in food science and nutrition and working alongside the uh, postdoc in my lab named Aaron Triber to um, develop the tools for studying a genetic population, but also to test our breeding lines of interest. And so it's kind of fun. We have a, a trained sensory panel. It's primarily graduate students, postdocs, and staff. And we use a trained panel um, because they have now been trained on, on the scales that we use and to identify the different um, uh, standards and samples that we're providing to them. So it, it's hopefully giving us some unbiased results. 
one of the biggest breakthroughs that we've had in this process um, and it was, um, was the development of a digital tool to collect this data. I had an undergraduate who joined my lab from BBE. Um, she wasn't a plant person, but really was interested in our project. And so we gave her the task of developing this tool. And um, the ultimate solution was a Qualtrics survey instrument that we can implement on a smartphone or on a tablet, which reduces the burden of actually being able to um, have to transcribe all the paper data sheets into uh, a spreadsheet. So we get the data as soon as it's entered, which makes it so much easier to understand what's going on. The goal of this project is ultimately to link flavors and aromas to the grape genome. Um, Lizy is using a genetic mapping population of about 100 individuals, plus the parents and grandparents of, of that family. She's using all the data from the sensory panel. And then she's also doing some uh, more high throughput phenotyping using gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which is an analytical uh, chemistry technique which allows us to pull up um, many of the different features or compounds that these berries are producing and look for variation among them. That variation allows us to do the genetic mapping part and allows us to assign which chromosomes might be playing a role. And once we know that information, we can develop DNA tests that can be used to screen the parents, to find those with, um, that carry the genes and the alleles for those traits, and also to screen the seedlings when, screen the seedlings when they're in the greenhouse. We've been really successful with linking traits with the grape genome, um, thanks to some really fantastic collaborations, especially on a project called VitusGen and VitusGen2, which are NIFA, USDA NIFA funded projects. These listed here are some of the most recent. Sun Li Tae was a PhD student in Jim Luby's lab um, when I was a postdoc and we worked on pottery mildew resistance. Since then, um, within my lab and with some collaborations, we've uh, identified insect resistance. Uh, I have a grad student who identified um, genes involved with trichomes or the, the hairs that are on leaves. We're working to under, understand flower sex. I had a graduate student study cluster architecture and berry color uh, and a current student who's working on leaf variegation or white and green different patterns on leaves. So this these techniques have been working very, very well for us um, and excited to, to report that we have quite a few papers coming out on that. For the breeding program, like I mentioned, the goal is to really have tightly linked DNA markers so that we can kill our seedlings when they're about this size. Um, they're very small. They haven't cost us a lot of money. We haven't handled them too much. We haven't planted them twice, once in a nursery and once in a vineyard. And so if our DNA tests can predict that some plants aren't going to perform well, we'd love to get rid of them early in the process. And since about 2016, we've been using DNA markers to do this um, process, and each year we find more and more traits associated with places on the genome, and we've been able to kind of speed up the process of breeding by enriching which good plants go to the vineyard and get rid of the bad ones when they're really small. People always want to know what's in our pipeline um, in our breeding program. I wanted to just show three different potential seedless varieties that we've been investigating. Um, I'm not going to talk much about them because I might get in trouble by uh, our Office of Technology and Commercialization, but just wanted to show some of the variation that we see. The one on the left has these beautiful pink berries. It's tasty. It's cold hardy. We've made wine from it, which is maybe suitable to add in with blending. The one in the middle is unique in that it has these unique flavor profiles. It has a bit thicker skin. I've used it in baking. I've cooked with it um, in muffins, just like a blueberry. And I thought that was a really uh, unique approach. And then the one on the right is really aromatic. Um, it's strawberry and pineapple in flavor, but you will smell this grape before you even see the clusters as you're walking up to it in the vineyard. So all three of these have some of those unique flavor attributes that we think consumers will be interested in. Of course, I can't do any of this work uh, by myself. Uh, it's the work of some, a fantastic team. I'm not gonna list everyone um, on these slides, but wanted to really pull out the two folks most in charge of leading the efforts in our table grape projects, which are Lizy and Aaron. Um, we have pretty much 14 people at any one time really focused on the, the grape breeding project. Um, and we get some fantastic support from places like the Minnesota Department of Ag, um, the university itself through the grants and aid program, 
uh, through the USDA NIFA uh, grant programs, uh, also SARE, the Ag Experiment Station, uh, and then um, some other funds and uh, Minnesota Nursery Corporation helps with some of the royalty fees that uh, come back to us through sales of grapevines. So there's about, like I said, 14 or 15 people on our team. Um, and we get some really great volunteer support. Thanks to Kim at the Arboretum and John and Jenny from, for coordinating volunteers. We can get um, big teams of volunteers to come do tasks that would take us a week or more. So the picture I'm showing is a group from General Mills, but we also have another great group from Wells Fargo. They came out and put in these bamboo stakes in less than an hour, a task that would have taken my team uh, about a week. And so it's really great when people can chip in and spend some time and get outside and handle plants and get excited about the research that we do. We also um, have three industry stakeholders to, uh, groups who support our research and we participate in events with them, do extension and outreach and engage with them in many different ways, including the Minnesota Farm Winery Association, the Minnesota Grape Growers Association, and the Southern Minnesota Wine Growers Alliance. And then finally, my last slide, since uh, this is a CFANS audience, I wanted to point out some of our key collaborations that we've been working on within CFANS. Um, in Hort Science and a number of different departments working with Extension, uh, it's been really, really great uh, to come in uh, into this role and find collaborations of people who are really interested in working with grapes, promoting our grape and wine industry, uh, and helping solve some of the issues that we face when we start growing these plants in a commercial scale. Um, just as a point of interest, I calculated the number of people at the university who in as part of their paid position work on Grapevine and I came up with over 35 people at any one time across the year might be engaged with supporting the grape research or the grape industry. And to me, um, that really means a lot to have fantastic collaborations and knowing that I can count on uh, our university resources to advance our efforts. If you're interested in knowing more about the work that we do, I just put our website up here on the bottom, enology.umn.edu. That's where we um, communicate some of our extension efforts, share resources about how to grow grapes. It's a great place to find our contact information. And with that, I'd love to take any questions or comments that might be coming from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Maybe we'll have you just keep your screen up here in case we get any questions specifically about a slide. Sure, that sounds great. So I'll start with a couple of the most recent chat questions that came in here. Uh, from Echo Martin, do you have any volunteer opportunities with your program for individuals or other ways they could help grape research? Great. Hi Echo, nice to hear from you. Um, I think if, if people are interested in volunteering at the Hort Research Center, the best place to get involved is through the Arboretum uh, Volunteer Coordinator. Uh, her name is Kim and her last name is blanking on me at the moment, but that's uh, one of the best places to volunteer. I should comment, lots of people like to volunteer to come taste our wine. We keep that uh, group closed and it's, it's not as much fun as you'd think it would be. Uh, a lot of the wines have interesting flavors and high in acid and they're not the commercial wines that you like to drink and we're only tasting those wines. Um, other ways to get involved if you're interested in research, outreach, um, and participating, emailing me um, would be another great place. And you can find my contact at this website. Thank you. All right, from Jennifer Flynn, I noticed you listed a paper that had something to do with flower fruit cluster architecture. Can you mention some pros and cons of different cluster architectures? Sure. Hi to Jennifer too. Um, let me see if I can get back to the right picture of me. I try not to include pictures of myself in my talks. I find it creepy. Um, so if you see the picture here on the right, we have two very distinct architectures for these bunches. The one on the left is open, um, which is probably favorable for most grape growing. And the reason is that if those berries are moist or wet, they're less, uh, they're more likely to dry out when they're open. They're not touching each other, which means that the skin isn't breaking down. They often, when they're touching, the, the skin starts to break down. That leads to spotted wing drosophila being able to lay its eggs. Uh, that's a great place for great berry moth to travel from berry to berry as the larvae um, can move from berry to berry and create havoc. And so tight bunches are a bit of a challenge like the one in my left hand or on the right. That looks a lot like Pinot Noir. It works okay, um, but it can lead to berry splitting. 
um, you know, there's a, a handful of reasons why you may not want uh, a gray cluster to look like that. The open clusters also, um, in traditional grape, table grape production, the, the clusters are sprayed with gibberellic acid. That increases um, the size of the grape berry itself. It also elongates the cluster. And if they were too tight, the berries would get really big and they certainly would split just from the pressure of the, the berries growing into one another. So that open cluster helps with some of the management practices that are used in table grape production. Thank you. All right, from Daniel Larkin, has there been research on potential for growth in the table grapes market? It seems like it's been down to red versus green seedless for a long time, and there may be a lot of untapped consumer interest. Yeah, I don't, I actually don't know much about the research in that area. Um, we do see, uh, I was just at the um, International Table Grape Symposium in Chile, and the, the breeding programs are all interested in getting new products into market. Um, the challenge is the grapes that we eat now are traditionally, they have pretty well established management practices. Grapes aren't the easiest thing to grow. Uh, every grape that you eat has probably been handled by two or three people in the vineyard before it gets to you. And so new varieties are going to be a challenge for growers um, in terms of uh, adoption there. And then in many cases, they are shipped uh, all around the globe. They're held in cold storage and have some other issues. And so um, I think consumers certainly want these products. It's just trying to figure out how to grow them, um, finding out which ones work, and it's going to take a bit of time. Uh, we know that some of the new grapes that are coming into the market are, are more challenging. Uh, trying to get the flavor and color right and the shipping right all in one package is a bit of a challenge. Thank you. What types, uh, this is from Dylan Van Boxel, what types of traits are of highest interest to growers when they make considerations for the varieties they want to grow? Great question, Dylan. Um, if we're thinking about uh, grapes in general, I think that in Minnesota, key things that they want to know are, is it gonna be cold hardy? Uh, that's paramount. So that they can have um, uh, sustainable profits year after year. For wine grapes, I know that the, the kind of the holy grail around here is a, a red fruited grape for red wine that has high tannins and low acids. Um, that's pretty much told to me every week that I've been on this job for um, five years. And so I know that's what they want. Um, disease resistance is really important. Um, Pest resistance is important. You know, we have lots of new, newish invasive insect pests, and growers spend a lot of time spraying, which is not sustainable for the environment. It's, it hurts their pocketbook. Um, it's not great for their personal health. Um, so, anything that we can do to improve sustainability, I think, are the, the targets that they're interested in. All right, from Susan Schofield. I have some grapevines that are not in a good spot. They're about eight years old and don't produce much. Can I transplant them? What would the success rate be? Great question. You should call Julie Weisenhorn today. She's on WCCO at 11. Uh, she, she can answer your garden questions. Uh, just kidding. Um, you know, grapes do transplant pretty well. Um, you could also start some new cuttings from those grapes. Um, uh, if they're not under patent, for example, those dots would be pretty easy to do. Grapes prefer full sun all day long. That helps to, to keep the leaves dry, to keep the fruit dry. They also like to do lots of photosynthesis. They're like a big um, solar panel. So getting them into a new place is a great idea. Um, I think if you were to dig a pretty decent sized root ball, you'd be um, able to manage moving those grapes relatively easily. You want to do some root pruning. You certainly want to prune back uh, the upper parts of that vine to move them. Um, and you may even want to encourage some suckers or some new shoots to grow from the ground once you transplant them to become your new trunk. Um, so I think your success rate can be pretty high. Uh, an eight-year-old vine might look like all sorts of different things. If it's not growing in a good spot, it's probably pretty wimpy. And so moving it, you, you'll probably do okay. Thank you. How is the University of Minnesota partnering with the Minnesota grape and wine industry to get our research to market? Great. Um, 
uh, myself, Annie Claude, and the rest of my team, we work pretty intimately with uh, the different stakeholder groups, um, partly to help identify what the needs are, whether those are extension type needs, uh, programming to, to help um, improve quality. Um, we work with them for testing. So we, we um, work with certain growers um, and universities to test potential new varieties. We do tastings at events where we like um, the cold climate conference that's put on by the Minnesota Grape Growers Association. So we try to stay engaged with them through the process so that the work we're doing isn't um, a completely black box. Uh, try to engage with them about where things are in the pipeline without getting hopes up too high because you know we can have a polar vortex that kills many of the plants in our vineyard and, and then um, we're kind of starting over with some of those things. So we, we work with them in those sort of ways. Um, for example, I also, or some of my staff attend pretty much every meeting that each of those groups has as a way to give them updates on what we're doing and, and, and to engage with them. One of the, I think one of the best things that um, we do is run by Drew Horton, who's the enologist or the winemaker and my team, and he hosts regular winemaker roundtables. And those roundtables have been really, really successful. And um, they come to the, the Hort Research Center, everyone brings a bottle of wine, winemakers bring their own, and they taste those wines blind, and they comment on them, they learn about them, they learn about different processes, uh, and it's been a really great way to build community. And I've been really proud of that effort in particular because it's helped push a group of winemakers who I think used to work in isolation and, and think that they had some sort of trade secret uh, to becoming more collaborative and engaged with one another and being a, a community of practitioners who are interested in really promoting the work that we do, but also promoting the work of the Minnesota grape and wine industry in particular. Thank you. Okay, I'll combine a couple questions here getting at the same main question. Do you see grapes evolving to be more like apples and that consumers ask for them by a specific name? For example, asking for a Minnesota grown grape um, and how close are we to having something like a Honeycrisp University of Minnesota table grape that would be recognized and preferred by co consumers just as much? Hey, that's, th those are great questions. Um, I do think that we're going to start to see more consumers asking for these grapes that are being marketed under brands, whether they are the cotton candy, which is one that has gained quite a bit of popularity or some of these other named varieties or trademarks. Um, that has become pretty obvious. Uh, like I said, in Chile, where growers are trying to figure out ways to do that and we see the, the same sort of licensing and trademark mechanisms that have come into place in grapes uh, as they have for apple and other uh, fruit crops. Uh, the next part of the question is how long until we have something like this? Uh, I'm just happy to report that two of the grapes that are on the slide, the yellow one and the, the blue one, are new varieties um, that we've sent out for testing to growers and to, to nurseries. That's kind of the the next big step before we pull the trigger and decide that something's going to be a new variety. I think there's opportunities for these to be really great for homeowners and for um, local producers across, hopefully across the Midwest, who are interested in producing these for farmers markets, CSAs, and schools. Even better if they make their way to grocery stores at, through wholesale market channels. Um, but the way that I've been conceptualizing this is kind of starting a little small um, and figuring out how to get them into kids' lunches at schools, um, university cafeterias, uh, and then at farmer's market, because those are great places to figure out what the interest is. And that's where people engage with food and local agriculture. Just one other comment. Um, there are some growers who are producing for schools and at farmers markets with a few of the Elmer Swenson varieties and they receive up to three dollars per pound retail for those grapes and that compares to about 76 cents on average that a wine grape cultivar receives. So the opportunities for growers to make some money doing this we think are there as well. <laughs> 